This man tore his underwear into strips, tied them into sections, and then soaked them in a barrel of strong liquor. He then gathered some old plastic bags, poured all the liquor into them, and finally used the knotted strips to tightly seal the bags, creating a completely enclosed space. Just like that, a makeshift deep-sea bomb was made. Michael concealed it well and took it out of the cell. In the scorching heat of over 40 degrees, the prisoners, enraged by the lack of water, reached their boiling point. Some even stuck their tongues into the dry valves. If no solution could be found, not only would Lechero's position be at risk, but there could also be a loss of life. Without delay, Michael hurried to the sewer. He touched the walls of the blocked water supply system above. Where there was water, there would be dew, making it clear where the blockage was. After determining the approximate location, Michael opened the maintenance hatch of the water supply pipeline. He slowly lowered the plastic bag along the pipe wall, perfectly blocking the pipe. Finally, Michael struck a match and ignited the fuse. The flame quickly spread down the alcohol-soaked strip. With a loud explosion, the blocked water pipe was blasted open, and the entire prison shook. Before anyone could understand what had happened, water was already gushing out of the valves. The prisoners scattered, rushing to the water outlet to enjoy the rare coolness. With this move, Michael managed to preserve Lechero's dominance. Although Lechero despised Michael, he was burdened with the guilt of numerous murders. Even if he killed James, he couldn't leave prison. Thus, he might as well owe Michael a favor. So he handed James over to Michael and promised that no one would ever touch him again. Michael breathed a sigh of relief. Now, he had to plan how to escape with James. But before that, Michael needed to ensure Sarah and LJ's safety. Meanwhile, he prepared for all eventualities. While Michael planned the escape from inside the prison, Lincoln attempted to rescue Sarah and LJ from the outside. To ascertain their location, Michael had Lincoln inform the company that he must speak with Sarah today. Lincoln goes to Susan B., the company's contact, and says flat out that my brother won't break out of prison until he talks to Sarah on the phone. Susan B. thought this request wasn't too excessive, as it was just a phone call. So she agreed without hesitation, but Michael soon discovered that the prison's phone lines had been removed long ago, and the only phone that could contact the outside was in Lechero's possession, although Michael had just helped Lechero avert a crisis. Lechero, seeing Michael as a thorn in his side, flatly refused to lend him the phone. The only option left was to seek help from Teabag, who was thriving under Lechero's wing, but since it was Michael who had sent Teabag to this prison, why would he help Michael? I'm like your new compadres, I know who you are, what you've done, and who you've done it to. Let me get this straight. You're saying you're going to tell on me? Michael continued to threaten Teabag. If you don't help me, I'll spill everything about your pedophilia and rape. Panama is a religious country. If they find out about the filthy things you've done, do you think you'll see tomorrow's sun? This tactic worked wonders. Teabag immediately admitted his fault. While Lechero was getting a haircut, Teabag quietly stole the phone. Make that 26 minutes till he gets back. If that phone ain't back in the crater, we're both dead, you hear me? Because my Alabama ass is not going down alone. After getting the phone, Michael immediately contacted Sarah. They seemed to be catching up, but Sarah was subtly hinting at her kidnapping location. It's like they're giving you until midnight and I'm sitting here at 3 a.m. However, Sarah was cut off after just a few words. Based on the limited information, Michael guessed that Sarah was kidnapped in a small town 20 kilometers away. With the Victory Tower landmark visible, Michael immediately called Lincoln to search for her. However, as Michael was giving the crucial location, Lechero and his men arrived. Michael quickly hung up the phone and put it back, but he was trapped and couldn't leave. At the critical moment, Teabag came to the rescue. Let's go! There's something you should know. What? I think that barber might have... You got me? Mm, no. No, my mistake, I did. No, in fact, that, that there might just be the best shave I have ever seen. <laughs> what? It looks like you need one today. How much you do that? <laughs> Can't be walking around looking all, uh... <laughs> Lechero was amused by Teabag. Looking at Teabag's fawning face Sammy hated to go up and give him two slaps. Meanwhile, Lincoln had arrived at the base of Victory Tower, but because he couldn't hear the specific location, he was in distress. Sarah saw this from her room and took off her shoe to throw it out the window. Sarah. Lincoln hurried after it and stumbled upon LJ, being held hostage. LJ! 
In the end, LJ and Sarah were taken away in a van by the company's people. Lincoln was very disappointed. Just returned to the hotel Susan B's phone call. Go check the underground garage. I've left a small gift there as punishment for your foolishness. Apprehensively, Lincoln went to the garage and saw a blood-soaked box from afar. Inside, to his horror, was Sarah's head. The next day, Lincoln visited the prison with a grim face. Unaware of what had happened, Michael slipped him a note, asking Lincoln to prepare the items listed on it. Because they were crucial for the escape plan, Lincoln's gaze was vacant. He wanted to reveal Sarah's death several times, but for the sake of his son, he chose to keep the secret from Michael. Bellick was sprinting towards a corpse, but he was a step too late. Another person had already snatched one of the shoes. The two of them fought over it, neither willing to back down, ultimately resulting in each getting one shoe. Bellick put on the shoe, which was several sizes too big, but it was still better than nothing. Bellick deeply understood that in the hellish Sona prison, not even a puddle of muddy water would be willingly shared with you. He went to Pistachio's cell where two men dressed in oddly matched outfits began negotiating over the ownership of the shoe. Bellick offered to trade his body for the shoe, but the other party was not at all interested in his plump type. Seeing Pistachio pull out a razor blade, Bellick immediately backed down, but it was just a misunderstanding. Pistachio was a barber and had no intention of harming Bellick. Seeing Lechero come in for a haircut, Bellick wisely bowed his head and left quickly. After Pistachio was done, Bellick, still harboring ulterior motives, ventured into Pistachio's room again and finally found the shoe. But as Bellick was putting on the shoe, he overheard Michael and Mahone plotting something, seemingly hinting at an escape plan in their conversation. Bellick's attention is no longer limited to food and clothing. He immediately finds Michael and threatens him. Don't think I don't know what you're planning. If you escape without me, I'll expose you. But Michael was no ordinary man. With a little trick, he managed to remove this thorn in his side without affecting his escape plans in the slightest. In the afternoon, Lechero was leisurely enjoying the breeze from an electric fan while watching the World Cup when suddenly, the prison experienced an inexplicable power outage. He urgently called his men to check the wiring, but while they might handle a fight, anything with a hint of technical complexity left them clueless. Lechero was at his wit's end when he suddenly remembered Teabag mentioning that Michael was an architect. He rushed downstairs to find Michael. The food supply in Sona prison depended entirely on this phone to communicate with the outside world. If the phone couldn't be charged, all the prisoners could potentially starve to death. But Michael was in a tough spot, as the electric cables were buried underground along the prison's outer walls. To repair the circuit, the soil had to be dug up, and Michael had clearly seen a prisoner shot dead by guards for getting within 30 yards of the outer wall. Michael didn't want to risk his life. But Lechero assured him he would negotiate with the guards. Seizing the moment, Michael asked for a cell with better lighting in return. It's the first one to get sunlight in the morning. You get me that cell, I'll get you electricity. Lechero agrees. But what he doesn't know is that it was Michael who created the illusion of a short circuit. Michael had borrowed an insulated crucifix from McGrady and stuck it in the air circuit breaker. His goal was to wait for Lechero to come to him, so he could naturally request a cell change. This room offered a broad view, allowing clear observation of the watchtower and surroundings, making it the best place for an escape. Soon, with Lechero's intervention, Michael and others were allowed to dig and repair the wiring under the supervision of guards. However, before they even left the prison gate, Bellick eagerly followed, volunteering to join the digging. You're doing something here, Schofield. You're right. I am. I'm fixing the electricity. If you want to help dig? Dig. At that moment, Bellick was unaware of the big pit waiting ahead for him. Under the watchful eyes of armed guards, several prisoners dug up the cable along the wall. Michael opened the junction box and secretly buried a small object inside, then covered it with soil. Bellick. Who saw this, quietly took the opportunity to leave and ran to Lechero's room within minutes to report on Michael. Bellick couldn't fathom Michael's plan. Knowing he couldn't join the escape team, he thought it better to use this information for some tangible benefit. Bellick told Lechero that Michael had buried something underground, not knowing what it was for but sure it was in preparation for an escape. After detailing Michael's ingenious maneuvers from the first season, Lechero was shocked. Lechero immediately dragged Michael outside forcing him to dig up the soil to check for tampering. Open it. Move the dirt. Now. It's duct tape to fix the frayed wires. That's why the power was so inconsistent. I didn't want the tape to come loose, so I packed it down with dirt. 
Although no flaws were discovered, Lechero still did not trust Michael. He demanded that he accompany Michael to the electrical room to turn on the main switch. When they arrived in the basement and Michael saw the crucifix in the back of the electrical box, his heart nearly leaped out. To avoid detection by others, he had to close the switch on another electrical box. As expected, the power still didn't come back. Under Lechero's instruction, an irate Sammy swung a punch, and Michael, taking advantage of the situation, fell back against the electrical box and quietly removed the crucifix. Michael went on to say that there must have been a delay in the transformer for the call to come in after so long. Lechero and his man, not being particularly educated, were easily fooled. After this incident, Michael got his desired cell, and Bellic was summoned to Lechero's room by Lechero himself. Sammy forcefully pushed Bellic onto the table. Lechero slowly poured a cup of scalding coffee, walked up to Bellic, and lifted his shirt. <laughs> Michael touched a clothesline in his cell before approaching the window, where he saw a janitor digging a hole next to a body that was nearly rotting. The janitor picked up a canister next to him and began spraying a chemical on the body, while a sign on the nearby wire fence starkly warned of high voltage. Michael, adept at spotting flaws and minor details, seemed to have thought of something. From this moment on, the plan for Prison Break 2 Zero officially commenced. In the hellish Sona prison, it was almost a daily occurrence for prisoners to die from hunger or duels. Guards would take the bodies out of the prison every so often. To prevent people from faking their own deaths they'd even put a few more rounds in the body and dump it outside the quarantine zone. Over time, this gave rise to a relatively well-paid outsourced profession, the gravedigger. Gravediggers would spray a chemical called Kesslever on the bodies to eliminate the stench of decay. And this chemical could corrode steel once heated to a certain temperature. This provided Michael with an opportunity for his escape plan. But before that, they had to deal with the gravedigger to ensure he would inadvertently spray some of the chemical on the wire fence during his work. Michael reached out to Lincoln, who came to visit, asking him to bribe the gravedigger from outside the prison. Michael was attempting to escape because a mysterious company had kidnapped his girlfriend, Sarah, and his nephew, L. J with the aim of having Michael extract a man named James from the prison, but Lincoln doesn't know what to do because the company killed Sarah last night. But to save his son and to ensure the escape plan didn't fail, Lincoln had no choice but to keep the truth from his brother. As for why the company was so determined to get James out, James explained, he said he was a sailor who often took people on sightseeing tours at sea. A year ago, he had hosted an oceanographer, but since then, Government officials had continuously asked James to take them to the areas the oceanographer had visited. Fearing trouble, James hid in Panama until he accidentally killed the mayor's son and ended up in prison. The message sent out through the body was for his girlfriend, Sophia, to retrieve a book on birds. This book on birds was actually a navigational log that only he could understand. To return to the places the oceanographer had visited, one would need the help of this book. But Michael had no interest in these matters. That's between you and the company. I just need to get you out of prison. After that, I want nothing to do with you. Meanwhile, outside the prison, James's girlfriend, Sophia, learned about the escape plan from her boyfriend. Since their goals aligned, she joined Lincoln to assist. Since Lincoln also needed a local translator, he agreed to have Sophia accompany him to bribe the gravedigger. However, when they found the gravedigger, he shockingly demanded $15,000. Fortunately, it wasn't their money to spend. Lincoln made a call to Susan B., the company's liaison, but when they arrived with the money, the gravedigger greedily demanded more. Unable to tolerate this, Lincoln grabbed the insatiable man and pinned him against the car. Susan B. told Lincoln to stop and let her handle it, then began to rummage through her bag. No, 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 no! What the hell are you doing? We need him! He will sell us out to the cops after he takes as much as he can from us. Killing the gravedigger marked the failure of the escape plan, but luckily, when Lincoln visited again, he told Michael that they'd slipped some money through other channels and arranged for someone they trusted 100% to fill in. Initially confused, Michael rushed to see who the new gravedigger was. Michael smiled in relief, surprised to find it was his loyal friend Sucre. So, what had Sucre been doing during the days he was apart from Michael? Sucre had been searching for his girlfriend Mary Cruz's whereabouts, learning that Bellic, who had kidnapped Mary Cruz, was sent to the same prison, he even visited once, under threat. Bellic finally revealed the truth. In that house in Mexico, he hadn't detained Mary Cruz and Sucre's aunt but had forced them to leave at gunpoint. This meant Mary Cruz was safe. 
After leaving, Sucre managed to contact Mary Cruz, but halfway there, he remembered he was still a wanted man in the United States. Going there would only implicate Mary Cruz, and without money, he couldn't support her. So, he decided it was better to stay and earn money to send to her. On his way, he happened to meet Lincoln, who told Sucre about Sarah. Sucre also learned that Michael was in prison, as a good friend of his. How could he stand by and do nothing, just as he also need to earn powder money for the children? So he agreed to Lincoln as gravedigger, with Sucre's help. They successfully opened a gap in the fence. Now, all that was left was to deal with the two guards in the watchtower to make their escape from the prison successful.